The United Nations General Assembly held an emergency session on the Israel-Hamas war this morning. Vote to stop the killing. Vote for humanitarian aid to reach those whose very survival depends on it. Do you not think it's unbelievable that this resolution here today and this session are not solely focused on Hamas's atrocities? When reading this resolution, Hamas seems to be missing in action. We must stand against this war in Gaza and the humanitarian catastrophe it is causing. This debate comes as the U.N. Security Council remains deadlocked and while Israel is calling on U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres to resign over comments he made earlier this week. Guterres said the Hamas attacks didn't happen in a vacuum, but clarified later that the grievances of Palestinians do not justify the appalling attacks. We're going to dig further into that situation at the United Nations with Louise Blay. She served as Canadian Deputy Permanent Representative to the U.N. from 2017 to 2021. Louise Blay, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for coming on tonight. My pleasure to be with you this Let, evening, David. Let's start with what Secretary General Guterres said. His leadership is being questioned at the UN. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has called on him to resign over his remarks on the conflict, but Guterres didn't back down and instead opted to contextualize what he said. What do you make of this particular episode? Well, you know, this particular Secretary General is not exactly bold. He's been very conservative with his comments throughout his tenure, even his second mandate now. I think that his comments were taken out of context. Obviously, his address to the UN Security Council was very balanced, but he did channel the feeling of the majority of the member states when he did say that, yes, that the attack did not happen in the vacuum in the sense that this has been a long-standing conflict and there's a great deal of sympathy at the UN for the plight of the Palestinians. There is a, a UN agency that's dedicated to taking care of Palestinians because of the, the hardship that mm -hmm. they have been facing for decades. It's interesting, though, to see Israel call for his resignation and, and then to say they're going to deny visas uh, to UN officials to go into Israel. I have no clear sense how that might complicate their work um, um, in this situation. Uh, but this doesn't seem like a helpful development, given what's happening, for, for, for relations to break down so completely like this, potentially. No, no, it isn't. And obviously, the Secretary General is not going to be Israel's choice for mediator once there is a political process in place, that's for sure. But uh, I, I predict that Israel will have to back down on, on their stance. Um, I think they're feeling the heat. Um, obviously, the world has been appalled at the attacks on October 7th, but it's been two weeks now, and there's been a lot of bombings, and there have been a lot of suffering on the Palestinian side. So there is a sense, uh, you know, the world didn't have a chance to react on October 7th. It happened, it ended in a matter of day. But now the bombings have been going on for several days with with a lot of images that are difficult mm -hmm. to take. And the, the, the member states are expecting a member of the UN Security Council to uphold the UN Charter. Hamas is not a member of the UN of the uh, of the UN. Right. And so this is this is the difference. Uh, yes, Israel feels that it's being held to a higher standard, but it, it is a member state. So, so it should. So they're feeling the pressure, and we're seeing this right now. And I think they'll have to absorb that and, and adjust accordingly. Yeah, there, there is a structural imbalance baked into this in terms of global expectations, right? Because Israel is a democratic state and a member of the UN, as you say, and Hamas is a designated terrorist organization in Canada and, and a lot of other countries around the world, right? So the expectations are different. Uh, but, you know, while that sort of has played out uh, between Israel and, and the UN, the UN Security Council is trying to deal with this. And, you know, if something comes from Russia, it ends up getting vetoed by the U.S. side. If something comes from the U.S., it ends up getting vetoed by the Russian side. And, and it's just paralyzed. So, so what can the Security Council and the UN actually do in a situation like this? Well, it's pretty clear that not very much. Mm. Unfortunately, it was the same with the, the Russian Federation invasion in Ukraine. The UN Security Council is totally polarized and paralyzed. I mean, yesterday it was really disheartening to see that they were arguing over semantics when people are dying. And so much so that now the General Assembly did the right thing. 
they said, okay, enough is enough. You're not able to settle this. We will call an emergency session under the Uniting, uh, United for Peace, um, which has been in place for a long time, but seldom used. And now they've moved the debate inside the General Assembly, where you're having a little bit more of a democratic airing out of world the world, where the world stands. You know, when you learn about the United Nations when you're in school and the idea of how it's supposed to function, it seems like the perfect entity for a situation like this. And uh, it seems as if they're not being listened to in, in the broader geopolitical sort of argument that's happening, right? It's sort of the regional powers and the great powers like the United States, you know, trying to, to influence what's happening between Israel and Hamas. And right now, we, there's an inability to negotiate a consistent flow of humanitarian aid uh, into a, you know, into a, a small area of land that is a, a theater of war, but also a, a, a humanitarian disaster. So how... I mean, what is the diplomatic path forward on, on this, Louise, to sort of ease some of the suffering of, of people right now in, in that part of the world? Well, the UN is part of the equation, but it's not the only equation. But I'm very pleased to see that there is this emergency session. It will continue tomorrow. Jordan is putting forward a resolution that will be voted on probably tomorrow that calls for a, a ceasefire and, and humanitarian aid. I haven't read the text. It's probably being negotiated at the moment. I think all eyes should be on that tomorrow because it's when you're going to see how much support it, it garners. Mm -hmm. who the sponsors are, because there's many ways in which you can offer support. You can vote for or abstain, or you can also sponsor. So tomorrow, I think, is a very important day that will give um, Israel and Hamas a real uh, uh, picture of where the world is at, and I hopefully give a lot of civilians that are affected hope that uh, that the UN, if it doesn't have a binding Solution in the General Assembly, at least it has the moral ground and it can it can help uh, those other channels that are happening, whether with the United States or Qatar or Egypt and the other players that are now trying to negotiate some sort of a ceasefire. Um, they'll right. be they'll be helped and informed by what's happening at the UN. It's 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 an ecosystem of diplomacy that is absolutely fundamental. Okay. Louise Blay, we're out of time, but thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. We appreciate your insight.